Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Tuesday, August 27th edition of AZ BioPeers, where we have Richard Kovacic joining us from Healthcare Growth Group to discuss really crucial knowledge to help our startups attract and engage investors. So thank you for joining us, Richard. And you, you may bet. begin. Great, you bet. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, thanks, uh, Joanne and AZ Bio for having me present this morning. Thanks for joining me this morning. I'm very happy to talk to you about uh, a subject that I'm very passionate about, which is um, which is growing uh, companies and um, supporting founders uh, uh, in their big business goals. The topic of our presentation is preparing for investor success, essentials for startups. Um, for an overview, um, the objective for today is to provide you with an overview of the knowledge and the considerations needed to attract and engage your investors, especially as you prepare uh, for the White Hat Conference and other um, funding opportunities. Uh, for an outline of topics, I will be providing a brief introduction on myself, my company, the Healthcare Growth Group. I'll be talking about the current market conditions, um, along with the industry trends, the challenges, and the opportunities. Uh, I will be um, talking about the importance of a commercialization strategy, uh, the essentials of an investor deck, um, uh, I'll be talking about the importance of building a credible leadership team, and I'll be providing you with a fundraising uh, preparation checklist. I'll then provide you with my contact uh, uh, and opening it up for questions and answers. Now, uh, keep in mind, this is one person's perspective. Um, I, I'm intentionally keeping my remarks general uh, uh, for the reason that your uh, in innovations uh, and the space that they're operating in are very nuanced and very specific. So I'm very happy to answer any specific questions in the Q&A or offline. Uh, about me, um, I am the founder and managing director of the Healthcare Growth Group, which is a company that I started last year uh, after being the chief development officer and general counsel um, for six years at Vimed Healthcare, which is a company that we grew from um, uh, its um, humble but ambitious origins in rural Louisiana to become the largest uh, national uh, provider of um, uh, respiratory disease management services, uh, that we um, grew the company to all over 48 states and took it public on NASDAQ. Uh, I was an inaugural member of the American Association of the Home Care uh, of the Home Care of, of the AA Home Care Payer Relations Council, excuse me, which is a group of home care uh, payer experts that are um, that are tasked with um, uh, uh, reimbursement, commercialization, uh, 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 challenges, and being a think tank for the industry. Uh, on those issues, uh, especially uh, with regards to the, the payers and the regulators. Uh, previously to that, I founded Comprehensive Mobile Care, which is uh, a large uh, mobile uh, integrated healthcare delivery system for residents of skilled nursing facilities. I also served as a director of Reach Out Healthcare. I have my um, BA and JD from the University of Michigan and MBA from the University of Arizona. My uh, personal uh, um, Areas of expertise are business strategy, growth, legal affairs, strategic marketing, payer network development, and contracting. And my team um, operates in, in other ancillary areas as well. So uh, a word about my company. Uh, I started this company last year uh, to serve as a partner for a growth stage healthcare, health tech, and life science companies. Um, we are experts in strategic planning and implementation, support for healthcare market entry, growth, and national expansion. Um, we focus on strategic product and service offering development, 
value proposition development, strategic marketing, payer reimbursement, commercialization, gr and growth to maximize investment revenues and earnings potential. Uh, one of the themes of my presentation is going to be that um, innovation requires offering development to plug into the existing market and regulatory and payer uh, framework. And this is what we specialize in, the strategy and implementation of that. Um, we bring the relationships, the experience, uh, and the capacity to handle uh, 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 and achieve uh, business objectives so that the founder group uh, can fo continue to focus on uh, technological innovation and development. Um, I've mentioned my team of multifunctional experts. We segue into areas involving strategic marketing, payer network development, legal affairs, compliance, government advocacy, industry relations, operations, investor relations, and anything else that a C-suite executive uh, at a at a uh, mature or growth stage corporation might be asked to do on a daily basis. Uh, we do this under turnkey uh, arrangements, partnerships with our clients, mostly like outside executives. And uh, our passion is really to create value and help you capture that value while transforming healthcare um, for the better. The current market conditions. Uh, I'm a healthcare. Uh, I'm a healthcare person, um, so I will talk mostly about healthcare. But I think these concepts are uh, applicable to life sciences generally. Um, uh, in that, life sciences uh, really impacts healthcare and taps into the healthcare market. And as I was thinking about what to say, you know, I, I had to get back to the the fundamental um, premise that we are undergoing uh, a modern day gold rush with historic challenges and opportunities. Um, our system re reached about 4.8 trillion in 2023, that's national health expenditure, close to 18% of the GDP, and is continued to uh, expected to continue to outpace the GDP growth to close to 20% of the GDP by 2032, uh, close to $8 trillion, but that's a conservative uh, CMS estimate. Uh, some like Deloitte uh, will say that that number may be as high as 26% of the GDP uh, by 2040, um, uh, $12 um, trillion in absolute terms. We're an outlier in the world. Um, we spend twice as much per capita as Germany, four times as much as South Korea. And according to the World Health Organization, uh, we have 40 to 45 percent of the uh, spend healthcare worldwide, with just 4.2 percent of the world's population. That's the good news or the bad news, depending on how you look at it. Um, now let's talk about the the capital markets. Um, PitchBook um, data confirms what we all know, which is that 2023 20, uh, was a very tough year for startup capital. Um, and PitchBook uh, came out with a mid-year report recently, uh, downgrading its already low expectations for 24, citing inflation, high interest rates, and geopolitical tensions, um, among other things. So we're looking at another rough year. Um, and we have to look at this from the perspective of our audience, which is we also live in a climate of low returns for inv investors, including poor exits and low distributions. Uh, the new forecast uh, of just under 80 billion, which is the, the mid range estimate for 2024, will fall or would fall uh, just below last year's total of 84.7 billion, um, which is less than half of the totals in 2021 and 2022, which were record years for us. Uh, but there's a lot of upsides here. Um, significant dry powder exists in the market. Funding is closing, um, driven by systemic challenges and opportunities, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and the United States is by far, um, by far the best market for both funding and for market opportunities in the world. Um, of the 28 billion uh, raised worldwide um, uh, for health-focused funds, so this is a different metric, 
19 of those were in the United States. So we're in a competitive environment, uh, as we'll see, dominated by smart money investors, as we'll see, where you are in control of your destiny. And the better prepared that you are, um, the more successful that you can be in this market, as we'll see. Okay, industry trends, challenges, and opportunities. So what we're seeing is something very interesting. Uh, we're seeing a genuine culture shift, um, unlike anything I've seen in the last 20 years, in the form of growing acceptance that innovation is necessary to create a uh, uh, significant impact on the US healthcare system. Um, the challenges and opportunities currently resonating with st stakeholders and investors include, um, and I ask you to think of these as you uh, think about the problem that you're solving and who you're solving it for, but worsening access to affordable care, barriers and gaps in care, increased inequity with widening demographic and geographic disparities, uh, we have tremendous geographic and specialty mismatches between concentrations of providers and underserved populations. An aging population, of course, we've heard about that for a long time. We have tremendous margin compression caused by inflation, supply chain constraints, and labor market strains. Staffing shortages in clinical and non-clinical positions. We have a dynamic and competitive regulatory landscape, and we have a very uncertain reimbursement outlook to go along with our uncertain economic and political outlook generally. Uh, I think I've, I don't remember a time ever when uh, we were in a political climate where uh, we could go from um, uh, facing the possibility of uh, uh, nationalized health care and or uh, total re repeal of the Affordable Care Act probably within the next few months and anything in between. So uh, it's a very, very interesting climate. Um, and I, I should add, we think about these because again, we need to frame our pitch in the form of what problem are we solving for whom? Uh, okay, so the the payer trends it's worth talking about the payer trends because so much of the commercialization strategy is going to come down to the payers so our, our market is highly lucrative as we've seen but also very very complex regulated fragmented dynamic competitive whatever words you want to use to describe it will probably apply um we have a system that's being sliced and diced in so many different ways as far as jurisdiction um federal, state, local, public, private, semi-public, uh, population-based payers that focus on certain populations and certain conditions. Uh, and we also have a, a rising number of combinations of integrations and partnerships. So uh, vertical integration among payers uh, is, um, is happening, and that's it's happening in the form of ownership, it's happening in the form of partnerships and everything in between. Um, the hot topics are the growth in managed care and Medicare Advantage payers and enrollments. This is very, very significant because where providers used to be able to access the markets through straight Medicare or Medicaid, uh, providers are now having to comply with the extra regulatory um, framework and gatekeepers that are the managed care companies. So, um, Keep that in the back of your mind and table it uh, as we continue the discussion. Care management uh, is is really the buzzword in the in the payer industry, uh, and it works towards the goal of utilization management. So really, um, the the payer industry is unlike any others. They try to limit their costs. They try to limit their exposure uh, by keeping payers out of network making, I'm sorry, keeping providers out of network, making those providers that are in network uh, follow certain policies and procedures, uh, using qualification criteria, auditing, making sure that all the claims are, are proper, um, and so forth. So um, payers are investing a lot of money right now in improvement efforts and innovation to reduce costs, improve outcomes, enhance patient satisfaction, 
uh, and increase differentiation and competitive positioning in a very competitive environment. So one of the, the, the byproducts of this move to managed care is that there's a tremendous amount of competition for covered lives among uh, plans that are offered in the same markets. Um, and what we're seeing is increased investment and development by prov providers in payer initiatives and payer offerings to reflect the opportunity. So we have a tremendous amount of investment uh, by payers on one, on one, one hand and providers on the other hand in innovation. This is good news for all of us innovators. Challenges and opportunities. Okay, so, so what does all this boil down to? Uh, all, all of this boils for you, all of this boils down to the fact that the industry and payer trends create a very powerful uh, economic incentives for the stakeholders um, for value creation through innovative solutions. So anything to do with cost, productivity, efficiency, Profitability improvement and optimization is really hot right now. Care and outcomes improvement, really hot right now. Broadening access to care, super hot. Uh, closing care gaps, improving the patient experience, and increasing the market differentiation and competitive positioning, very hot right now. So when you present your investor decks, when you draft and then present your investor decks, those concepts will resonate with uh, the investors, the smart money investors, um, and those concepts will resonate with um, with uh, your target market as you will define it. Um, uh, the adoption isn't of innovations is not limited to just technology. They also include regulatory changes and reimbursement solutions. So you are seeing a lot of regulatory changes being pushed in the form of different qualification criteria, uh, more generous qualification criteria, um, in the form of uh, value-based care initiatives, remote care initiatives, uh, behavioral health, remote patient monitoring codes, and so forth. All right, so what are the buzzwords? And I'll just go through these very quickly because I think you all get the idea. Uh, remote care and home care is hot. Uh, RPM and wearable technologies, uh, definitely in telehealth um, is uh, has taken off uh, and never and never took taken a step back after COVID. Behavioral and mental health issues are really really big. Uh, health equity is is huge. Uh, what's what's being recognized is that these uh, demographic and geographic disparities are really driving the cost for payers. So now the payers are really paying attention to the fact that their bottom line is really affected by the fact that, they're, uh, that there are large segments of the population that have never had access to, to um, an equal standard of care. Social determinants of health, uh, which is uh, technologies that are being used to determine uh, health conditions based on uh, a person's social conditions, such as homelessness or being unemployed or, um, food insecurity or anything of the sort. Uh, obviously prevention, care coordination, chronic care management, population health management um, is continues to play a very important role. Technologies and platforms that facilitate these, uh, these therapies and modalities are, are absolutely in. Value-based care, any technology that contributes to um, value-based care is big. Value-based care is a tough topic for the industry to, to, to tackle. So anything that assists with that um, is, is, is really at a premium right now. Um, e EHR, EMR, and IS data integrations and interoperability between payers, providers, and solution partners is really big. What we're seeing is that integration and interoperability is really posing a challenge to adoption of a lot of our innovations. And so now we're having innovators come out with umbrella solutions that come in and integrate all of these great innovations and ideas that are, that are hitting the market. Um, vertical integration and the rise of pay providers uh, is big. Women's health finally is getting the, uh, getting the uh, attention that it deserves. Uh, I was very encouraged to see that uh, women's health funding was was up about 300%, which was the highest area of healthcare that was up last year. And health tech, really hot, especially anything involving AI. 
smart money investors and really all investors uh, and all consumers are really now looking and asking whether a solution includes a component of AI, but anything involving data, software, and platform solutions, uh, especially referral platforms, patient engagement platforms, and clinical decision support platforms. All right. Well, thank you for uh, your patience as I went through those concepts. I think they're very important because to, to the extent that you can make your innovation hit one of these pain points, and by all means, I went through those quickly, refer back to the slide deck, but to, but to the extent that you can make your innovation fit within one of these buckets or something similar, um, you are automatically going to be, uh, you are automatically going to be um, uh, getting a head start on traction with your audience. All right, commercialization strategy. Uh, this is uh, the most important part of the presentation, and I hope I can capture it right because it's a very, it's a very complicated topic. Um, and the key, uh, the key premise here really is that many great ideas fail uh, as a business. We all know this to be true. Um, so the important thing is is you take your great idea and you develop and implement a winning commercialization strategy, all right? Um, and that includes an offering, a strategic marketing plan, a revenue reimbursement pathway, and a pathway to scale up. So you have your great idea, but you combine that idea with what the market conditions in a complex market offer you. All right. And it may not be the most obvious pathway, but it may be the fastest and most efficient uh, go to market strategy that maximizes uh, your probability of success, value, potential revenues, earnings and funding opportunities up front. Your goal is to get funding. Your goal isn't to change the world uh, right out of the gate. Your goal is to get funding so you have that opportunity down the road. You need to demonstrate a really clear alignment between the asset that you've developed, the valuable asset that you've developed, and the offering design, the benefits that you've designed your offering to give to your target market segment, and your commercialization strategies. For this, you need to have a really good grasp of not just your technology, which I know that all of you do, or your innovation, but you need to have a really good grasp of the nuances of the market. Um, you need to have uh, a clinical proof of concept and uh, health economics evidence, AKA a business case. That can come in different stages. So it depends on uh, what stage of funding you're receiving, but sooner rather than later, you are going to want these things. And you must be able to convince very sophisticated investors because yes, they are mostly smart money investors and yes, that's what you want, um, that uh, a solution can win regulatory approval, secure access and adoption in appropriate markets, uh, commercialize and scale. You've got to be clear about what problem you are solving for whom and how. Okay, this is my attempt to visualize the complexity of what it is that you're being asked to do. Um, you have a multi-dimensional opportunity matrix where you have different technologies that are effective at offering benefits to different segments of the market that are being funded through different funding mechanisms in different geographic markets, depending on the population. And you have got to get to a point where you and your team are working in a fashion where you're figuring out what the most um, viable, efficient, quickest, most likely to succeed path to market is. I can't tell you how many discussions I have where I meet with uh, founders that say, I've got this technology, it's great. And you know what, truly it is impressive. Um, and we think it would be great in a hospital setting to do the following. The problem is, is that 
when I listen to this and when a smart money investor listens to this, our insights and our experience tell us that the pathway to that market segment is really challenging. That may be the that may be the downstream potential, but the but the the, the path is not quick and efficient. We're going to have to uh, invent. Uh, we're going to have to get regulatory approvals. We're going to have to get um, um, uh, a new reimbursement code, and so on and so forth. And looking, we're looking at a long pathway. Um, and after discovery and after some amount of diligence. The answer is yes, that's the potential, but your quickest and most efficient pathway to market is actually as a uh, management services organization for a different market set, for the ACO market segment. Let's use that as an example uh, instead. Okay. So the so these discussions need to take this form because that is exactly what your um, smart money investors will be thinking. Okay, tips. Um, again, strategy that identifies the most efficient and most effective go-to-market strategy that maximizes your probability of success while, all the while, giving the smart money early stage investors an understanding of the downstream potential of this um, innovation. You need to demonstrate an ability to execute on these selected payer strategies. So great, you had some help putting together your deck uh, with somebody that understood the market as well as you understand technology. But do you have the people on your team that can help you execute on these strategies? Um, investors are going to be thinking about uh, uh, whether your revenue model is diversified, scalable, risk mitigating, attractive and valuable at exit with green space. You don't want to create something that is going to be um, built for speed to entry and take over the entire market uh, only to wipe out your opportunity when they are ready to exit. Uh, you want to have plenty of green space uh, for growth. Um, you want to create a proprietary model with high barriers to entry for other competitors and subsequent entrants. Um, so as challenging as it is for you and as frustrating as it may be for you at times to try to navigate the healthcare and payer markets, understand that this is also going to be a, um, a barrier to entry to future entrants. You need to think about aligning uh, incentives across multiple uh, stakeholders, if not all stakeholders, uh, payers, providers, patients, partners, and investors. Um, anything that solves solutions for multiple populations is uh, going to have that much better a chance of succeeding. Um, and again, in a competitive market, using the complexity of the market uh, and your strategy as a barrier to entry. Okay, uh, payer revenue pathways, I just want to add this. Um, these may be offerings and strategies that are targeted to the payer market segment. Will the payers buy the technology, the platform, the innovation um, that I have been developing? Or you can use your payer knowledge and payer expertise to target another segment using the payer strategy and offering as a differentiator. So if you understand the payers, you can go to providers and say, you can go to the payers and say, here is a product or a service that has value to you, or you can go to providers, or you can go to patients, uh, or you can go to other um, others operating in the healthcare space and say, this is going to have, this is payer related and it has value for you because it increases your competitive positioning or your success with the payers. Um, understand that anything involving payers is going to be very lucrative. It's a trillion dollar market in the United States every year. Uh, they control the purse. Uh, certainly any sophisticated investor with most things, I'm not going to say all, but most things is going to want um, uh, payer strategies and understand that anything involving payers is going to require the reimbursement to exist. So you to fit into an exist existing uh, reimbursement framework 
and or a pathway to a new reimbursement and is going to require payer market access. Um, in addition to that, it's also going to require regulatory and contractual compliance in the appropriate markets. So no long, so you're not just having to play by the 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 government's regular to all the appropriate jurisdictions regulatory rules, but the payers are going to have their own rules and requirements. So the cost of business is high. The upside is huge, both in the market and with investors. All right, let's talk about the investor deck. Um, and this is all of these things are my perspectives. Um, you know, I encourage you to do independent research, watch other presentations. I am telling you what I have seen uh, in my experience, um, in my 20 years of, of, of healthcare experience. Um, but I think the most important consensus that you'll find among all sources giving this type of uh, providing this type of information is that you need to that is very critical to clearly and concisely communicate a compelling business case and readiness, your readiness to go out there and actually um, uh, implement uh, this strategy, the, the, this business, uh, this business strategy on day one. So the critical elements as I see them is the team. I, I want to put the team up front. You've got to introduce yourself. Um, you've got to talk about the problem and the solution. What is the problem that we're solving and what is our solution? You need to provide a uh, company overview, uh, basically talk about when you were founded, um, the basics of where you stand right now, your company mission. Uh, you need to talk about the size of the market and sophistication here is very, very important. Because the total addressable market, of course, is the average revenue um, for a uh, per paying customer by the total possible number of customers out in the market, assuming you capture 100 percent. It's very important to drill down and, and talk about sub segments and the sub segments that are reachable through your market strategy. So these are the questions that an investor is going to be asking uh, themselves when they read your presentation. And I want you to ask those questions before you put the slide deck together. Um, you know, don't talk about all the people in the country that have that have heart disease. Talk about talk about the the five percent of those people that you can address through your innovation with your strategy and how every one of those is going to make you an X, uh, an X uh, dollar amount in revenue. And that is going to be much more compelling than starting uh, with generalities. You need to talk about competitive landscape because the first thing that an investor is going to do when they, when they see your investor deck is they're going to ask themselves, who are the competitors and what are they doing? And how is this innovation differentiated? You, know, talk, you need to talk about the key stakeholders. Um, who who is in the picture? Is it universities? Is it uh, the government? Is it the regulators? Is it the payers? Who are the key stakeholders and how are they being affected by this? Um, you need to provide details of your of your technological solution, but you have to really be aware of your audience. So I encourage you to do your research on who you're going to be speaking with and tailor your presentation to, to them. Unless they are technical and knowledgeable in your field, generally speaking, I would say be factual, provide the information, impress them with your knowledge, um, and move on. Uh, this is going to be a little tricky. Uh, early stage organizations are generally heavier on uh, the technical side of things. So you may have people that are, um, that are reviewing your investor deck that are going to say, uh, this needs more, but... Uh, I would say less is more, uh, less is more. They are, nobody is going to form a scientific te technological opinion based on your investor deck. They're going to take your word for it and they're going to come back to you with questions. Uh, of course, you need to show a very viable roadmap to success and you need to be able to um, have the investor understand what type of an exit uh, you are looking to achieve. All right. Tips, tips for an investor deck. So I'm a believer that uh, an investor deck should be self-sufficient, but not overcrowded. 
Uh, what does this mean? Some people use a PowerPoint as a presentation tool um, with just visuals. Uh, some people uh, make their slides overly crowded and difficult to read. You have to, I think, hit this in the middle. And the reason for that is, is because you are going to send your investor deck to somebody that you're not going to be speaking with. Um, so, so you want that person to be able to get the message, get the key message uh, by just looking at your investor deck. I'd say shoot for 15 to 20 pages, unless you use section dividers like I do. Um, use a reliable template. There's a lot out there. Uh, make sure that all of the critical elements are, are addressed and easy to access. Uh, you want the investor to read this and boom, 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 be fed the information exactly how they are used to uh, 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 receiving it. Um, you need to make sure that all the healthcare concepts are validated. This is very important. Um, this is a good reason to work with um, a healthcare or a healthcare business expert uh, because um, you don't want to raise any unnecessary red flags in substance and form. So it, it, it may be completely innocuous to somebody with a technological background, but if you use the wrong types of words um, or you make the wrong types of assumptions, um, you are going to unnecessarily uh, lose credibility with your audience. You gotta make every opportunity count. You know, I, I hear people say, um, this is this kind of an opportunity or that kind of an opportunity. And while it's important to qualify your opportunities, it's also important to keep in mind that most of us wear multiple hats. And if you think somebody is 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 trying to help you or be a service uh, provider to you, um, you know, keep in mind that they're also they also may be investors or may be working with investors that may be very interested in something. So I would say be prepared. Um, understand that you're selling yourself as a partner. So your ability to think, organize, communicate, achieve goals, influence others, and effectuate change is very important. So much as uh, it, so much as your idea, um, people want to be doing business with people that they like. So it's really important to come across as somebody that's organized and likable. Um, and for all these reasons, uh, you know, I would say it's very important to engage engage a healthcare business expert to provide industry knowledge, insight, and resources for a compelling deck for smart money investors. Uh, they're going to understand nuances of, of, of the subsector that you're targeting. They're going to help you understand the realistic timeframes, realistic pathways to revenue generation. If you don't have somebody like this on your team, uh, I highly encourage that you reach out to somebody. Don't assume everybody's going to, to, to charge you right out the gate. Uh, people like myself are, are very happy to, to pay it forward and have conversations and uh, you, you know enter into engagements um, only where it's where it's appropriate. Okay, um, building a credible leadership team. I think we're getting close to the end uh, here, but uh, this is a very important um, this is a very important part of it. Um, uh, in summary, um, in a way, uh, the current market conditions present a very, very lucrative and unique opportunities for innovators. However, the market is highly complex, highly competitive, highly regulated, and involves multiple stakeholders. That's what you, all of you are up against. Um, smart money investors, which is what you want. I've mentioned this concept before, and I'll elaborate on it right now. Um, smart money investors are, are folks with a background in, in your industry, your market, or your technology. And it is really the norm rather than the exception in the U.S. Uh, market, uh, just because of the volume of money and the amount of competition that we're talking about. Um, but they are also very valuable in that they can offer very valuable perspective, um, to you and in the form of uh, connections and insights and know-how and they can really help you succeed so you should be looking at your part as your investor not just as a source of funding but you should really be looking at them as a prospective partner too um so back to the the point operating and succeeding in this environment it requires an expert leadership team not just to develop the strategies in the investor deck 
but also to provide deep credibility to the prospective investors. So you want to make sure that the, the, the deck is developed. It's polished, but it's, but it's conceptually developed. And you also want to make sure that in that robust team of um, team members and advisors on the technical side, you have somebody that really understands the market and has done this exact thing with uh, success before. Um, it's going to be very critical to, to investors because if you don't have that person already, your chances of funding declines. And one of the and if you do get funding, the first thing you're going to be told is to add that person. Um, the um, critical pieces in looking for this is, is, is somebody that has deep know-how, experience, insights, relationships, and credibility in the healthcare markets, reimbursement payers, commercialization, laws, regulations, and industry norms. Um, credibility is very, very important. Once again, I can't say it enough. Uh, walking into a room with investors or uh, prospective clients or uh uh, partners for a pilot study is going to be very important. P uh, healthcare people immediately look at who you are, what you've done, with whom, who you know, and uh, and uh, then the business uh, then the business is 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 easy from there. Um, so uh, uh, the right partner can help you in, uh, formulate and develop the right winning deck with the right value proposition and strategy. Uh, skillfully implement um, uh, while avoiding distracting other team members from their core functions. Um, all right. And I think this is going to be the last slide. I have a fundraising prep checklist for uh, for you all. And this is something that I've put together um, in thinking about what's the last thing you want to keep in mind before you uh, go into a fundraising uh, presentation. Um, and I arrange this uh, by, by temperature, so to speak. So uh, the items that I think or I um, thought, of, thought of as high priority, I put in red. Um, priority, depending on your situation, I put in orange. And low priority, I put in blue. But um, I think to capitalize on investor opportunities, applicable formalities and requirements must be addressed or at least required depend, or at least um, considered depending on your situation. Okay, so what, do you, what are you gonna wanna make sure is done? It, generally speaking, you, your entity needs to be formed and organized to be ready for funding. Um, you need to have your business goals and strategies. You need to talk about uh, your capitalization to date, your exit. You're going to want your marketing strategies. I think it's very important to talk about the word marketing. Um, there's tactical marketing, which is materials, design, um, and so forth. And there's strategic marketing. And what we're talking about in this presentation is strategic marketing. What products, what services, what pricing, what placement, uh, uh, what means of promotion you're using. Um, so to have your strategic marketing in place, the most important one is the one in the middle, the reimbursement, commercialization, revenue, growth, and scale-up strategies. Uh, your development offering is very closely related. You develop a technology. How do you go from that technology to an offering that somebody will buy and pay the right amount of money for? Uh, you need to engage High value team members and partners. I've talked about that. You need to do your preparation for your investor deck. You need to have an executive summary. You need to have your talking points. Um, you need to research your audience and you need to have your accounting and financials because the prospective investors are going to want to know about that. Um, depending on your innovation, um, you are you may have to answer questions about systems and interoperability intellectual property that that may is that that could probably be in the red category um they're going to want to know what the barriers to entry are and how is your ip protected or will be protected um if your commercial contracts with payers customers partners and suppliers offer any kind of a um 
differentiate differentiating uh, factor, you're going to want to be prepared to talk about those. You don't have to have them, obviously, but say, hey, our contracts will be unique because we'll offer the following um, uh, terms to our target market. Uh, payer network development strategies are going to be very important. If you're going to rely on payers for your reimbursement, commercialization, and revenue, uh, you're going to have to talk about payer network development strategies. Uh, you're going to, to talk about business uh, development strategies and tactics, uh, depending on the the, the stage uh, that you are at. Um, and you're going to have to talk about legal and regulatory compliance. So be prepared to field those questions. Again, and operations. Again, these concepts are in orange because you should be prepared to talk about them. You may or may not have to include them in your deck or touch on them in your deck, but be prepared to field questions on them. And then I think the less important things, the things that may become important down the road or may become important depending on what you're trying to do is your brick and mortar necessity uh, and options, your government relations and industry relations, your insurance and your HR considerations. Um, my contact information, uh, I'm going to leave this up uh, for the moment. Um, feel free to uh, reach out to me um, uh, on LinkedIn, by email, or by phone. Uh, again, I kept this presentation um, uh, general on purpose. I want it to be applicable to as many of you as possible. And uh, I wanted you to understand and communicate the types of things that you need to think about as you are in the final stages of preparing uh, for, um, for your fundraise. So with that, um, I will turn it back over and open it up to questions. Awesome. So first of all, Richard, thank you. That was a great presentation. And thanks also to Dylan for putting all of this together. So a couple of quick questions. Smart money. Yep. So smart money, as you define it, are those people that have been there, done it, are living in the space, understand the pluses, the minuses, where your value can come from and where your, your hurdles are going to be? that a good smart money description okay yes what happens when you take dumb money uh i, I would take it uh i mean i would i wouldn't turn it down um given you know i, I mean given the choice between smart money and dumb money um Given the choice between smart money and, and dumb money, I would probably take the smart money. Um, in fact, I would almost definitely take the, the smart money. You don't. Your goal isn't just the money. It's not just the funding. Your goal is to do something transformative. And your goal is to meet uh, larger business objectives than just the fundraise, right? And so the smart money investor is going to... Um, to really be a, a partner for you in that, in my view. I agree. And um, also, if you are dealing with a less sophisticated investor, um, it's very, very important that you manage expectations. So if you're dealing with smart money, they know what your product pipeline timeline is gonna look like. They're gonna make their own independent estimates. If you're talking to your great aunt Sally and she's 80 years old and she thinks that she's going to see your new drug idea come to, to fruition in her lifetime, you need to be have a realistic conversation with great aunt Sally. Um, otherwise, you're going to have a very uncomfortable Thanksgiving dinner. So... It is important that you set expectations. Don't assume that your investors know everything, right? Um, no. But allow them to challenge your assumptions and don't be afraid to challenge theirs. Um, I remember a conversation I had with Tom Grogan a number of years ago. And Tom was talking about how difficult it was to raise the initial funding for his company 
Ventana Medical Systems. Now, we all know that Ventana got acquired by Roche for over $3 billion. Um, but what many people don't know is that Tom had over 100 meetings before he got to that first yes. And the way he got that first yes is, quite frankly, he lost his patience and he challenged the assumptions of the investor. Um, so when you are secure in your thesis and in your data, don't be afraid to challenge the assumptions. It won't necessarily get you the investor, but it at least sets the record straight. Now, Richard, again, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate you being with us. And I'm going to let you um, pop off and I'm going to do the last closing comments and commercial for Arizona Bioscience Week. Thank you so much, Richard. All right. See you all at... Uh... At, at White Hat. Thank you all for attending.